Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to New America. I'm Justin King. I'm the Policy Director in the Asset Building Program here. Uh, it is exciting to have you all here today. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a, a great crowd here, both in terms of quantity and quality. Uh, we also have a, an online crowd uh, of folks that are watching, uh, streaming on our website. So welcome uh, to all of those folks as well. Today's conversation is on retirement security federalism. Uh, Illinois Secure Choice and the Future of Saving. Uh, folks might know our work in the asset building program here in New America uh, is dedicated to significantly broadening access uh, to savings uh, and to ownership opportunities, uh, particularly for low and moderate income Americans. And, and I don't think you have to work that hard to see why that mission uh, is important. Uh, and, and really, I think at this point in our nation's history, really really vital. Um, savings becomes wealth, uh, and wealth in today's America is really opportunity. But unfortunately for, for far too many Americans, both of those things are really in, um, in short supply. Uh, wealth inequality today is m much more stark uh, than is historically normal in America, and, and much more stark uh, than the more frequently discussed income inequality. Uh, the racial wealth gap is an ongoing national embarrassment. Uh, black and Latino households hold, on average, just 6 and 8 uh, percent of the wealth of white households. Um, and it really becomes easy, and, and indeed, I would say, tempting in this space to get very pessimistic. Uh, we work in a field with, with talented and dedicated researchers who are constantly churning out detailed studies of financial lack, uh, of want and shortcomings, uh, exclusion, and not to mention uh, financial victimization and predation. Um, I'll give one quick example uh, because it's recent, it's on my, on my mind. Our friends at the Pew Charitable Trusts came out with a new study recently looking at household balance sheets and found that 55% of American families uh, don't have one month's income set aside as emergency savings. I'm not a certified financial planner. I think we could probably find one in the audience today, and I don't think that person would disagree, me, disagree with me when I said that's less than recommended. Um, the, the lack of emergency savings is, is really well known in the asset building field. Um, but I don't think I, I'm on thin ice if I say that the lack of retirement savings is a much more frequently discussed and better known problem um, certainly among policymakers, and certainly, I think, among the media. The uh, National Institute uh, on Retirement Security recently did some public opinion work in this space, uh, and they found that th the American public is on board here as well. 86% of Americans believe that the country faces a retirement crisis. Uh, so since everyone is already convinced, I don't have to go into great detail, I don't think, about, about why uh, this is a topic of discussion. Um, I won't, uh, but I think it's important to, to note that there are, there really are sort of key elements of the retirement savings gap um, that have some pretty broad agreement when analysts look at them. Uh, one of the things is that there's an access gap. There are far too many people that simply don't have access to an employer-sponsored retirement plan, um, and, and decades uh, of data tells us that if you don't have access to an, a, a, an employer-sponsored plan, you're probably not going to have access to a plan at all. Um, that's about half of the workforce in total that's, that's uh, excluded from the employer system. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a big problem. And the other, the second part of, part of the problem that's really widely agreed on is that even when folks save, uh, they don't save enough. Uh, and so that really gets magnified when you consider that half of the workforce uh, isn't saving for retirement at all, uh, but it's really an acute problem. I, I would add a, a third part of that. I think there's less agreement about this, but from my perspective, uh, part of the problem that's really serious is the system that we have has uh, greater inclusivity and greater inducements for saving for people with higher incomes. Uh, and so it really leaves uh, a significant number of struggling families uh, facing uh, steeper hills to climb. Um, so there's an access gap, there's a lack of sufficient savings, 
there's an incentive problem. Uh, and those conditions are really connected to the wealth and opportunity gaps that we see so frequently discussed uh, in the media and among policymakers. So as I said earlier, it's easy to become pessimistic, uh, but I actually think that there's some real and significant reasons for optimism in this space. Uh, first, those conditions were created by policy choices. Uh, and that means that they can be altered by policy choices. We can make things easier and better for people. There's been a consistent drumbeat uh, among think tanks like New America uh, and among policymakers about addressing these problems. And we've seen a wide variety of solutions floated. There are plans out there to make it easier for small businesses to offer 401ks. There are wholesale scrap everything and replace it with, with this um, plans that are out there. There are hybrid plans that try to marry uh, the benefits of the old school defined benefit system with the, with the newer defined contribution system. Um, and you know, also I would add into the mix, there are plans uh, to expand Social Security, which a lot of people see as probably the easiest and simplest way to make sure that the most vulnerable Americans are cared for in retirement. Um, I would think, I think it's fair to say that most of those plans at this point are a little bit dusty. Uh, the last major congressional action on retirement savings was in 2006, which I don't want to believe was a long time ago, but it, it's starting to feel like a long time ago. <laughs> I think Senator Biss knows what I'm talking about. Um, but while Congress has not been terribly active, at least in terms of producing legislation on this front, uh, that doesn't mean that no one has been active here. We, we are seeing real uh, and significant policy action and innovation happening uh, in a couple of different sectors. And it's, it's really an exciting time. Uh, in 2012, California passed a first-of-its-kind law uh, to create an automatic retirement savings plan for people whose employer doesn't offer them one. Uh, and th the law that they passed put in place a, a plan for a study uh, and then after the study sort of uh, measured the feasibility of the plan, uh, then uh, implementation could, could happen after that. They're still in the study phases, but I think what California did was give other states the permission uh, to look at uh, this model and say, this is a real uh, policy option that, that, uh, that states can choose to follow. Uh, I, I should note, in California, if that plan uh, becomes law and, and becomes operative, it could cover as many as six million workers in the state of California, which is, uh, which is extraordinary when you think about the difference uh, that a well-run plan could make uh, for that many families. Um, it's not just states getting in on the act. Earlier this year, the president, uh, early last year, I'm sorry, the president announced the creation of uh, My Retirement Account, or My RA. It's unclear whether uh, he knows how to pronounce the acronym yet. There's a lot of confusion on that point, uh, but I've got it right today. Uh, and and, and the, you know, the, the basics are my RA is a starter retirement savings account targeted at the same population that does not have a retirement plan through their employer. Uh, uh, there's a cap of $15,000 in total savings at which point people have to transition to another product. Uh, but it's an effort to fill the access gap and get people connected to uh, retirement plans that they don't have access to right now. We'll talk a little bit more about, about my RA later. Uh, but last year also, the Illinois legislature took up and passed the Illinois Secure Choice Savings Program Act. Uh, the bill was signed into law into January, and now the state is beginning the process of implementing a law that could ultimately cover as many as two and a half million workers in the state of Illinois. Uh, and again, could break down the barrier and lead to more states choosing uh, to take up uh, this option and to not wait for the federal government to do something uh, about the retirement savings crisis. Uh, there are initiatives now in different stages in as many as 20 states. Uh, so I think this is, a, this is an incredibly exciting time. Uh, and I'm thrilled uh, that we're here to explore some of these questions today. Uh, there really is uh, an incredible amount of opportunity and challenge here. Uh, and I'm thrilled that we have State Senator Daniel Biss here with us today, who's the primary author of the 
uh, Illinois Secure Choice Savings Program law. Uh, Senator Biss is a Democrat who represents Illinois' 9th Senate District, which includes Evanston, Skokie, Wilmette, and a number of towns whose names I won't even attempt to pronounce. That's, that's no slight on Illinois. I'm from Vermont, and I used to work for a senator from Vermont, and we would weed people out in the application process on whether they could pronounce uh, town names correctly or not. Uh, it's, it's an awful game to play with people. Uh, senator Biss is a former mathematics professor, uh, and, and as I said, he's, he's, uh, he's really the champion who helped uh, Illinois pass this law, uh, and we're really thrilled to have you here today. Um, Courtney Eccles is here with us today. She's the policy director for the Woodstock Institute, which is a Chicago-based nonprofit research and policy organization that works locally and nationally uh, on issues of really improving the financial system for low and moderate income uh, families so that they can save and build wealth. Uh, Sam Tuttle is also here with us. She's the director of policy and advocacy for the Heartland Institute, uh, a leading anti-poverty organization in the Midwest. Uh, Heartland does a really amazing combination of frontline service provision uh, and policy and advocacy work. Uh, and Sam and Courtney are two of the advocates who are really essential in, in, in shepherding uh, and mobilizing to help make sure that, that the, the legislation that Senator Biss introduced had the support it needed to become law. Um, so I'd like to spend a little time with you discussing how and why this happened, um, but before we get into the sort of backstory. Senator Biss, would you, would you give us uh, a thumbnail sketch of sort of what the law is and what you hope it does? Uh, sure. Well, first of all, thanks for <coughs> including me in this, and um, thanks for convening this discussion, uh, not only because it's an issue that I think is enormously important, but it's an issue about which we need to have more discussion both about policy, but also about the question of mobilization and public discourse. So I think this is an extremely uh, important and, and well-chosen uh, occasion, and I, I feel honored to be a part in it. So thank you very much. Um, you, you set the stage very clearly, so I'll, I'll just fill in some additional details. In Illinois, like in really the rest of the country, about half the private sector workforce lacks access to employer-based retirement plans. That winds up being just in excess of two and a half million people in Illinois, as we know, thanks to research done by the Woodstock Institute. Um, and like in the rest of the country, that population is saving extraordinarily little for retirement. Uh, the majority of that population is not saving at all uh, and is on a path to um, tremendous insecurity in retirement, uh, if not literal poverty. Uh, so I would characterize it as a clear and pressing and frankly terrifying human crisis uh, and, and one that, you know, to state the obvious, you don't solve today and as a consequence of that solution see the problem go away today. Any action taken today takes, you know, literally decades to really fully affect people's lives and so I, I felt that it was important that we act very quickly. So we spent a couple years um, in some of the cases of some of the advocates, more than a couple years, working to enact legislation that sought to solve three, or at least address three aspects of the problem. Number one, as you said, is the access. It attempted to create for many workers who currently lack access to a tool to save at work, the access to save at work. Number two, uh, we wanted to increase participation by making it an automatic enrollment plan, so you were by default in as opposed to being by default out. And number three, uh, because we're dealing with a population of um, typically lower and medium wage workers, many of whom are at medium and small employers, we wanted to create a large pool so as to help push down fees since people in those categories are often uh, exposed to really uh, perniciously mm -hmm. high fees that eat away at their savings uh, in, in unnecessary ways, quite frankly. So what the plan does is it says if you work for an employer, with 25 or more employees that's been in existence for two years or more and uh, offers no retirement plan of any kind, you'll be automatically enrolled at a 3% payroll deduction in a Roth IRA. You can opt out if you want. You can choose to put in more or less than 3% if you like, but the default position is to be in at 3%. 
A board is created, chaired by the state treasurer, who, by the way, has his uh, chief of staff, Julian Federley, here today, with six other members, uh, the state controller, the governor's budget director, and four appointees. And the board is responsible for overseeing the program. And their, their main responsibility, I would say, or most significant responsibility is to uh, make investment selections. The default investment would be a target date fund, but they may set up as many as four other options. And if they do set up more than one option, then, of course, the participant uh, would have the right, should they make an affirmative choice, to, to move away from the default. Um, so that's, that's what the, the law does. A, a word about timing. The law formally goes into effect because of some technical matters regarding the Illinois Constitution on June 1 of 2015. At that moment, the board is created and they have a two-year period to set up the program. So it may not be up and running until June 1 of 2017, but I think that fairly long runway gives us the opportunity to um, do it well and do it properly and make sure it's, it's, it, it runs in a way that will make other states want to replicate it rather than want to run the other direction. The last thing I could say really quickly is that um, Though when we were trying to pass the bill, 99.8% uh, of the criticism was from the right, um, which we'll probably talk more about later, since the bill has been signed into law, there's been some, I think, very legitimate criticism from the left. Uh, and two of those points are, number one, hey, look, employers with 25 or more employees, are you not um, designing the bill in such a way as to uh, neglect to help a chunk, a big chunk of the population you might want to help. And number two, is 3% really adequate? And I would say that on both of those points, the criticism is well taken. The number 25 was simply a, a concession. And we would hope that once the program is up and running and, and is easy to administer for medium-sized employees, we'll be able to drop that number. And the second thing is that the 3% was partially a negotiated concession, but also we didn't want the initial contribution for people who are already working to create sticker shock and drive people out of the system. Over time, what I think should be done to allow this program, when operating in its default context, to uh, create adequate savings is that automatic escalation should be put in over time. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me thank you so much for that. Uh, let me make a quick housekeeping announcement that I forgot to make earlier. I mentioned our online audience. Uh, uh, folks are welcome to join in the conversation on Twitter. Our uh, handle is AssetsNAF, N-A-F. Uh, and we're using the hashtag SecureChoice for today's conversation. Uh, if we get questions from the online audience, we'll try and uh, build those in later. Uh, you mentioned that folks have been working on this uh, for years. It did, you weren't able to simply wave a magic wand and pass a bill. Um, which is shocking uh, to everyone who's been in Washington, D.C. for uh, any amount of time, but particularly for the last, call it, five years. Um, Sam and Courtney, uh, you guys, uh, uh, your involvement in this really kind of predates Senator Biss, right? Um, can, you, uh, can you talk about sort of when you first started pushing uh, this solution and, and, you know, what was the reaction like uh, at first. I mean, Senator Biss and I are both in total agreement that the case four is pretty clear cut. Well, go you, ahead, go ahead. so um, around, and let me just uh, do a little bit of cleanup. I just want to make clear that I work with Heartland Alliance, not the Heartland Institute. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> Forgive me. Our policy perspectives sometimes are a little bit different. Um, but, uh, and, and we are also uh, the coordinator of the Illinois Asset Building Group, of which Woodstock and the Shriver Center, um, who helped uh, kind of seed this in Illinois, are um, extremely close partners. And sometimes when I think all of us talk about we, it's a little bit of a traveling we <laughs> in terms of who we're talking about. Um, we really kind of started working on this in about 2010. I know that the Shriver Center worked with David John to kind of think through crafting some legislation. Um, and then there were a couple of years where this legislation was kind of out there. And um, uh, we are nonprofits. We have some limited capacity. And for a couple of years, um, really having boots on the ground and, and educating um, legislators about the need for this, why this, there's a role for the General Assembly, was a little bit of a tough lip, lift. And all of us really needed to, as advocates, get in a place where we could invest that capacity to into that conversation. And then, and then I'm going to turn over to 
uh, Courtney, to talk about the research, I think a, a, an initial turning point for us is the Illinois Asset Building Group um, invested in Woodstock to do some research. And when that, that, that kind of first set of research came out, we, we started at least working with General Assembly members to understand you have a role here. And that's, that's you know, what the solution was, was a little bit still carrot versus stick conversation. But that first threshold of this is something that you ought to take up, everybody started to buy into once they saw um, the research. And I think really those first couple years were working up to that threshold question. But I don't know if you want to talk about the research. Sure. So I, I know you mentioned that there's been sort of some increasing attention to, to this issue at the national level. And there has certainly been national data and national research looking at the access problem and the lack of, of access to an employment-based plan. But um, what Woodstock did with, with IABG in 2012 is we released a report called Coming Up Short um, that really looked specifically at Illinois and access to employment-based plans um, for Illinois private sector workers. And what we found was, was very in line with, with what you saw nationally, that over 50% of private sector workers didn't have access to this type of plan. And as um, Senator Biss said, it's, it was a little over 2.5 million people, which you know that number is going to continue to increase slightly each year um, since we put out the research. Uh, but what we tried to do was take it even a step further, and we um, looked at looked at this issue by legislative district. And so we could we could sort of start by proving that this wasn't just a Chicago issue and it wasn't just a rural issue. Uh, and and even when we divided things up, we found that in every single state legislative district, over half of the private sector workers didn't have this type of access. And I think, as, as Sam was saying, that's really when we were able to say to every single single policymaker in Illinois, this is a problem and it's a problem in your district um, and that's why we really need to figure out what to do. And so um, in 2012, you know, we were still sort of working with the legislature and um, got a subject matter hearing and could really start exploring the problem and, and at least, you know, teasing out what the policy solution would be. And then it was 2013. Um, in 2014, where Senator Biss picked up the bill, and we really started, um, we made some tweaks to the policy itself, and then really started trying to move move forward with the legislation and, and gain some legs. And, and Senator Biss, what what was it that uh, that got you to 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 pick this thing up that had been out there for a period of time? Well, I have to tell a funny story about this. I uh, I had read about what happened in California, and actually met with some labor leaders in Illinois who had been involved in the effort in California and, and learned about that. And I was fascinated by it. And then I went to this meeting of, it's like a, like a breakfast meeting that happens every year near my district for legislators in my area held by this uh, association of um, insurance salesmen. And the way it's structured is their lobbyist gets up and gives a presentation about how great he is and then we're supposed to give a presentation about how great he is too, and then he says that we're great, <laughs> and then everybody goes home again, feeling slightly confused about what just, what just happened. And part of his presentation about how great he was, he explained that he had killed this automatic IRA bill in the 2012 legislative session. And I was like, that's fascinating. I didn't know there was one. And so the, when it was all over, I took him aside, and I was like, that bill that you killed, what, what was the bill number? <laughs> and, and he told me, and probably not wishes he hadn't. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it had been kind of percolating, but it only gotten kind of noticed in the relevant committees of jurisdiction. And, um, you know, my feeling was that there was this really committed group of advocates who had been pushing this pretty far and that what we needed to do is broaden out the coalition. And so we had, right at the very end of 2012, we had these long kind of complex substantive meetings with the various advocates that have just been mentioned and SEIU and AFSCME and, and a larger group to try to reach um, an approach to the policy that could get a big enough set of advocates behind it that we could then try to move things forward in the 2013 legislative session. And ultimately we were able to do that. And, then you know, fought fairly hard in 2013, but didn't really wind up getting where we needed to go. But you know, with every passing month, we're able to get kind of a somewhat bigger footprint, a somewhat broader set of supporters, and you know, again, chip away at this initial skepticism on the part of some of our colleagues in the legislature who were 
kind of recognized that there was a problem out there, but initially weren't so sure that it was the state government's responsibility to, to try to address it. So uh, talk to me a little bit about that policy design process, right? And, and um, w a little bit about where the push and pull was early, and maybe Sam and Courtney, like what was really different about where you were 2011, 2012 versus where you sort of uh, ended up in, in terms of deciding this is the, these are the elements of a plan that we want to put forward. Sure, so I can start and you two chime in. I mean, I think one of the things that we spent a lot of time discussing was um, the framework for the type of fund and the number of funds. Um, and that's obviously something that has been discussed in a variety of ways. Um, and originally, the legislation very much mirrored the federal legislation. And so it had a few choices with a default. It was a traditional IRA. Um, but what we were doing was looking at California and sort of what they were proposing, which had this guaranteed rate of return. Um, and we were trying to figure out a way to kind of include that piece while at the same time um, not necessarily pinning ourselves to have to do some research and feasibility. We wanted to be able to move forward with a bill that could be implemented upon passage. Um, and so we worked very closely with um, AFSME and SEIU and others uh, and, and folks who had been working in California to try and craft something where we had um, a target date fund as the default, a few other options, a conservative, a more aggressive. Um, and then we also included sort of this placeholder for a fund that could be approved by the board uh, at the time in which California or, or another state moved forward with something that would have this guaranteed rate of return. So it was a, a bit of, you know, legal tweaking to include the language and make sure it was done appropriately. But I'd say that's one of the big pieces that we tried to address. Yeah, I think that was a, a huge, a huge and a big policy question mm -hmm. facing the country is, you know, we've had this dramatic shift away from pensions to 401ks and it's been problematic in certain ways. And part of the goal of creating these big pools is to set up a new framework that it reverses some of the problems associated with that transition. And the question of how far to go along that axis is one that, that I think is still frankly unresolved and, and created a lot, of, a lot of complexity for us. Other critical policy levers that have to be addressed are where we, we're not prepared to make concessions. Our number one is there, is it, should it be automatic enrollment? Uh, there's, there's a lot of, even, even in Illinois, the home state of Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler, uh, <laughs> there was still a lot of queasiness about automatic enrollment. And then there was a lot of queasiness about what our opponents would refer to as an employer mandate. Uh, and, and we felt that those were aspects of the policy design that were not negotiable if we really wanted to maintain a structure that would, um, that would take a meaningful bite out of the problem. But subject to those criteria, we were frankly willing to negotiate quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, well, you mentioned a little bit uh, labor was really at the table here uh, with you guys. Um, can you talk a little bit more about about who some of those sort of early stakeholders were, um, and then sort of growing that coalition, sort of who, you know, who, who next? And, and you know, I'm really interested in sort of what the tipping point is between sort of uh, folks that are convincible versus folks that are off the table. Yeah, that's a great question. So on the labor side, SCIU is, I think it's fair to say really the only union that represents a very significant number of workers who would be affected by this. Most other unions that, you know, SAU because of its healthcare and home care workers has a lot of workers who are kind of practically almost self-employed in some sense and, and therefore are, are without retirement options. Most other unions fortunately negotiate better retirement <laughs> options for their members than this. And so there were two labor constituencies. One was SEIU, which was looking to help its members. And one was some of the public employee unions, which feel, I think, correctly, that part of the challenge for those who are seeking to defend public sector pensions is the what people call the pension envy that exists between workers in the private sector who have little, if anything, and, and public sector workers who have a, a much more reasonable pension. And so much of the discourse in Illinois, frankly, and throughout the country has been to take this gap and just try to push those who have down. And AFSCME in particular initially felt like the, this kind of approach by trying to push those who don't have up could transform the discussion and ultimately be beneficial to 
public sector unions who were trying to protect their members' pensions. I will say that eventually uh, there was some other tension in the coalition, and AFSCME wound up fairly disengaged. But that, that was the initial discussion. You had SEIU on behalf of its, of its members and AFSCME seeking to address this pension envy problem. As we went forward on the labor side, other public sector unions like firefighters and laborers who represent public sector workers got involved because of this pension envy argument, as did uh, the AFL-CIO in Illinois mm -hmm. for roughly the same reason. Now, we also found over time that we were able to engage more social service providers simply because they recognized that the people they served uh, were heading toward a real crisis in their twilight years. And so that was a, an, important, uh, an important ratifying voice as we sought to make the argument. And then we also worked very hard um, with opponents to really understand who was totally off the table and who was kind of potentially gettable. So for example, the, the life insurance industry was off the table. They, they were going to lie down in front of a freight train to stop this from happening. But that didn't mean that the entire financial industry was. So uh, we actually had supporters in the financial industry. There's a, a lobby that was that is formerly known as the American Society for Pension Professionals and Actuaries. It has renamed itself the American Retirement Association who has been a supporter of proposals like this around the country, including in Illinois. And then we found some aspects of the financial industry who had initially kind of as a, I think it's fair to say, instinctive or almost knee-jerk uh, basis just been opposed. We kind of sat down with them and, and walked them through it and they realized this is not our fight to have and, and they, they were willing to disengage. And so over time, what began as a small group of very passionate people on our side with essentially the entire rest of uh, organized interest <laughs> in the state capital <laughs> against us, we were able to grow, you know, grow our group of supporters and move some people from, uh, you know, being opposed to being either formally neutral or else functionally neutral. And, and those efforts turned out to be pretty necessary, I think, to mm -hmm. get it done. Mm -hmm. Sam, was it, um, was it, it sounds like there was a lot of sort of education and, and it was probably a, a touch heavy process to bring people along. Um, uh, but you know, you were involved in some of these efforts to, to educate folks and also to sort of uh, uh, finding out firsthand who, who some of the folks that were off the table for you guys were. Is it, is it really purely sort of about having the opportunity to, to literally engage and educate people? Or did you find that there were um, sort of messages and sort of broader scale things that you could do, uh, things that would play um, play a little bit more to a, to a mass audience? Well, I think there are key <coughs> points that, especially kind of in, in the, the last year, I mean, if we're looking at five years, right, the last year had a lot more touching of everyone than, <laughs> than um, in previous years, you know, that, that these are our folks' own money. I think, um, you know, we, we kind of were able to develop some talking points, but even before that, I remember one of the first conversations um, I think Courtney and I had with some of the financial institutions when we were working on other legislation, there was a, well, we don't think people can save who are lower income. And kind of just initial, almost from anyone, regardless of their position, kind of questions. And, and I do think that's part of the, the, the kind of multi-year process is, is getting folks past those questions. The same thing with, should this be automatic? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so a lot of those initial conversations um, with opposition, with, with folks who, in, who kind of came on board, getting people to, to kind of add their effort, were about getting past those lines. And then, and then you're in the final stretch, and there's a series of talking points where you're, where you're lining up people. And, and to a certain extent, I, I, I do think it's important to talk about once uh, Senator Biss got on board, we also had a messenger who, who kind of came back to everyone over and over again. It's, it's not just what we were saying, but also not letting people go. Um, and, and that's important because this is it. This is we kept saying this is a big bill. It takes people time to become comfortable with this legislation, even if they will, you know, eventually get there. And and in some ways, I think that's why having those multiple touches and kind of just coming back, even with like a so there's this, <laughs> um, is important because people need time to get their head around this legislation. I think particularly uh, for General Assembly members who aren't very accustomed to, to thinking about these issues. 
Can yeah. I add? So I think, I think in addition to that, absolutely. I mean, just on its face, this is a somewhat complicated thing, even though, you know, we marketed it as a very simple plan, but I mean, retirement savings in general is not simple. So um, it certainly required a lot of education just to help people understand what the program would do. But I think another important piece for us was this continued touching, and partially that's because the arguments from the opposition continued to change. I mean, you started off with sort of this basic, we don't need this because you already have IRAs in the public sector. So really needing to address the point that most people don't go out and get something on their own, or they don't have the amount of money that you need for an initial deposit. We had the people can't save if they're low income argument. So you needed to address that. But um, it was so, sort of a fascinating process because as we found ourselves gaining ground, we found more and more new arguments as to why this wasn't good. And maybe we'll touch on some of these things. But um, I think you, you'll find that states across the country heard the same arguments, but pieces like, um, you know, this is a government-run program, especially in Illinois, we don't know how to manage our money and our budgets. Um, so we constantly had to remind people that it was a board, but the board would be putting out an RFP. So it's a private investment company, just like what you and I have with our retirement plans. And um, there were a lot of arguments about um, ERISA and employer burdens. And, and so it's just each one of these pieces that came forward um, you know, we had to go back to sort of the full swath of legislators um, and make sure we still had their support and then continue to address these points with, um, with policymakers that we needed to still get on board. So it was a lots and lots of meetings, yeah. lots and lots of touches, I guess. <laughs> was this, did this jump at a certain point to, um, uh, to a point where it was a public issue? Where the, was the, was the me big media in Illinois involved? Um, and, and was the, you know, to what extent I hear sort of interest groups across the board having key roles here, mm -hmm. but to what extent did this become uh, a part of the, the public's conversation in Illinois? Uh, not enough, I would say. <laughs> I would also say that um, several different relatively high profile in the context of the state of Illinois um, reporters and media entities who I had badgered like crazy for two years <laughs> to pay attention to this. After a pass, they were like, where did this come from? What, what is this? This is <laughs> <laughs> seems kind of important. How come, how come no one ever talked about this before? Uh, and on some level, maybe that even helped us. Um, but it, we had a great deal of trouble making it a big issue. You know, that We worked closely with AARP, and they have a history of having really successful big community forums, and we, we had like a big, uh, big churches, you know, we would have these forums and the room would be set up for 200 people based upon previous attendance for similar events. And it was just hard to get people in the room. There'd be a lot of empty chairs. So we, we, we candidly struggled a little bit to get significant, genuine grassroots public interest, um, partially because the, um, the, there just wasn't ever quite enough coverage and right. partially because I, I think it's a complex issue. Sam McCourtney? Well, I would agree and say that I think that this is for, for advocates who are looking at, at moving this, this is a challenge. I mean, we, we, you know, Heartland Alliance um, also has been working on increasing the minimum wage in Illinois, which has its own set of challenges, but that is an issue that mobilizing people and kind of creating noise um, is a little bit easier. People feel like that, that, that benefit will come tomorrow. They understand income inequality, and so, so that's a different process where I think where we, or Senator Biss, was able to create a, a sense of, of noise was when we finally got endorsements from the Chicago Tribune and the Sun-Times and the State Journal Register. And that at least has um, a sense that this is, this is the time to act. Right. Um, I, I do think it's, a, it's kind of a, a hard nut to, track for, nut to crack for advocates in terms of how to create a real sense of grassroots mobilization on a program where the, the kind of benefits are coming multi, multiple years later and where you're sitting today may not be, you, you may not need um, secure choice today, but you might change jobs and you might need it later. And so it, it, it's hard to touch. Um, and, and that's something I think that was a constant struggle and we were always working on, but it's, it's, it's something that we, we don't have the answer to and, and um, will continue to be something that we work on in implementation, just getting the word out. Um. 
so, you know, I think for me there's a sort of picture that's coming clear of sort of who, you know, who's in your role here. It seems like they think you did a good job. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, there's sort of carrying the ball down the field and then there's punching it into the end zone. Um, and I'm going to do two different sports for different analogies later. <laughs> uh, just I to hope try one of them is lacrosse. <laughs> is the other one is curling. <laughs> Um, I wanna uh, that how do you throw the rock and have it land in the <laughs> house? Uh, really, I mean, no. I think there's an honest question here about sort of, um, how, you know, how do you how do you sort of make this happen at the end of the day? How do you sort of you know get you know having the legislation and the co-sponsors and the editorial boards and then how do you have the vote and how do you win the vote? So what, is there is there last yard? Strategy. Well, I'll say some stuff which will be um, very unhelpful to people who are trying to generalize. Um, we our legislative session adjourns at the end of May. This was a big election year for us. The governor was up for re-election. The Senate passed the the bill sort of during the regular calendar in April, uh, with no votes to spare, with Democratic votes only. And there, I think it's fair for me to take some credit, I was just insufferable. I just, you know, would not leave my colleagues alone. And they figured that if they voted for the bill, they would, then I would shut up. And, and so that was kind of how we got that, that <laughs> done. Um, and then we w did not have the votes to pass the bill out of the House that spring before adjournment. We worked it very hard. We spent the summer schlepping around the state of Illinois um, while everyone else was campaigning, we were trying to get members of the House to focus on a retirement savings vote that might happen after the election, um, and did a lot of work then while no one else was doing any work, which was very, very helpful. That was a situation where we, you know, we had the field of play to ourselves. It was you know, like everyone on the other team was in the penalty box simultaneously, and that was incredibly helpful to us. Um, and all summer long, when allies, particularly allies out of state, asked, so guys, are you going to be able to do this? I said the same thing every time. I said, it's going to depend on the outcome of the election, but I can't tell how. Um, <laughs> and that turned out to be true. And two things, two and a half things happened. Uh, three and a half things happened. <laughs> uh, the first thing that happened was that the, uh, there was an advisory referendum on the ballot regarding the minimum wage, which passed with uh, tremendous majorities, but for complicated reasons that are beyond the scope of this discussion, but interesting for us to talk about over lunch, if you're into that kind of thing, we were unable to pass a minimum wage bill. So there was this momentum to do something for low wage workers, reified by a referendum that we then didn't act on in the natural way. That was number one. Number two, the Democratic governor got trounced, frankly, in the election, much to the surprise of in contravention of what the polls said. So that was kind of a shocking outcome uh, to many people, or at least a surprising outcome to many people. And then number three and, a, three and three and a half are that the treasurer's election was basically a tie on election night, and there were two weeks of vote counting, which resulted after, during most of those two weeks, the Republican nominee having been ahead by a handful of votes at the very end, the Democratic nominee pulled ahead and, and won by, by a tiny, tiny margin. So we came into the what's called the veto session that happens right around Thanksgiving with this mandate from the public to do something for low-wage workers, but we couldn't get minimum wage passed. It was the end of the term of the governor who wanted to do something and was very upset we couldn't get minimum wage passed and he was going to leave. So if, if he was going to sign the bill, it had to happen soon. And then this Democratic treasurer had just been elected, and basically, with all this attention, because an election result isn't usually announced two weeks after <laughs> an election, basically the first thing he said is, hey, this is really important. I want to implement this program. I want us to pass this. And so his, I would say his significance in the political discourse in Illinois was, was very great then, because he'd won in this dramatic way. And for Democratic legislators, he was our one kind of success story in the election. And he really, instead of going on vacation and celebrating, he um, turned around and started calling legislators and working very, very hard on the roll call and also working on leadership to encourage them to make it a priority. And all those factors together resulted in, 
Democrats lining up and wanting to vote for the bill and passing the bill. Um, if some of those three things had turned out differently, I think the outcome would have been different. You could imagine, you could imagine all of those things turning out differently and the bill passing with a really different roll call. Like if the Republican nominee had won for treasurer and then announced he wanted to pass it, maybe we could have passed it with a more bipartisan roll call, who knows. But it was clear that all these different variables were going to land in a way that would impact our chances in the November session. And we were fortunate that they lined up in the way they did. Uh, never ceases to amaze how inadequate I'm just a bill, uh, the schoolhouse <laughs> rock version uh, is. It's harder to communicate what actually happens, but actually much more interesting. Sam, uh, Courtney? Yeah, I was just going to add in one sort of additional piece to that, and, and this might be helpful for folks who are thinking of trying to do something similar in, in their states. So, you know, we've talked about our, our sort of stalwart nonprofit <laughs> advocates um, who tend to have little influence but do lots of nagging. Um, and then, you know, we talked about how we sort of built this larger, broader coalition and brought on financial institutions and financial entities where we could. Um, but I think another piece that it was certainly something new for me and, and something that I would suggest folks in their state look at is when it came right down to it, even with all of the different politics that Senator Biss talked about, you know, we were sitting right on the edge of we need three or four votes and we've just got to get them. Um, and we had the opportunity to use some, some resources that we were able to get to hire contract lobbyists, which is um, you know, different if you're, if you're nonprofits who tend to just sort of work with, work with your own. Um, we have very rosy cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was, it was amazing and wonderful and I would say absolutely crucial to the success that we had because you know, for, for folks who do this work, um, often at the end it's going to come down to relationships and who can actually get that last meeting in with these final legislators. So we hired uh, for very short contracts a few legislators who were able to, or, sorry, a few lobbyists who were able, we did not hire legislators. <laughs> we did not hire legislators. Goodness. Um, so we were able to hire lobbyists who helped us um, immensely during those last few weeks, sort of right before the veto session, after the election, and then during the weeks of veto. And it was that sort of three to four week period of time that was, that was crucial. And so, um, you know, it's a bill that requires educating. It requires uh, doing as much as you can to bring on non-traditional allies. But it also requires a lot of very strategic political thinking and taking advantage of opportunities. I have, a, I have a burning question, but uh, we're approaching the point at which we're going to shift panels. So I want to um, uh, throw it open to the audience. We, we have a second panel today. Our second panel is, is really going to focus on um, how this effort fits into the national picture. Uh, and so if you have questions about that, you know, hold on to them. We, we will get to them. We have an, an incredible second panel. Um, but uh, for these folks and this question of sort of the how and the why, uh, in Illinois, I'd love to take a couple questions from the audience. Uh, great, we will start right there in the back. Uh, we have a microphone, and uh, give us just let us have it. Um, I'm very interested in the pension MD uh, aspect that you spoke about. Um, maybe even particularly the decay of uh, AFSCME interest and support of the legislation. Um, I think there's a, a really important um, strategic question that. Uh, the people who are working specifically on the pension envy question need to ask themselves, and are asking themselves, which is, do we want to take a posture of gradually lifting people up who have nothing to have better and better options, or do we instead want to take a position that the shift to defined contribution schemes is unambiguously to be condemned? And if we take that second position, is supporting any kind of uh, option, even if it's an improvement for some workers, uh, but exists in the defined contribution context, is that simply beyond the pale? And I, I can't speak to the internal discussions that AFSCME had, but my sense is that they eventually concluded that, that defined benefit pensions are under attack and that supporting anything in the defined contribution world is just kind of too dangerous on a messaging level for them. Um, I'll tell you, I personally land obviously in a different place. I, I think that, that there's so much discussion about this and the inevitability of this that talking about this instead, even though 80% you know, of the public says they want it when they're talking to pollsters, talking, doing this is sort of a paradigm change in the, 
heads of most people who are involved in policy making, and I think it's got huge spillover benefits. But I, that, that debate is still ongoing and I, I think not resolved yet. Let's go right here. Um, one question might be how to clone Senator Biss. But short of that, <laughs> <laughs> is there any, well, I'd like to ask about the 20 states that have something percolating and if there are any trends among those states that you see. And also, is there any thought of publishing a toolkit? Sort of, it's such an interesting story, how you did it, or things that might work other places to bring this to scale. That's I, a, I see this paper, yeah. I love this paper, but something more sort of easier to read, shorter type thing, and maybe just taking this and, and putting it in the toolkit form. We, we will get to the first part of your question later. Uh, Sam and Courtney, uh, I, I would sort of throw you under the bus and say that though you are resources, I think, who are willing to, to be out there for people, but sure. is there a toolkit in the works? Or? So we've actually, I don't know if you guys, we've, we've talked about that sort of thing because, you know, I think a lot of what you hear is the specific substance of the policy and the decisions we made, but I think some sort of toolkit that helps you think about, okay, now that we have this policy that we want to implement, what are some ways that it might be useful? It's something we've talked about. I don't know that there's any sort of formal process, but it is helpful to hear that that would be useful, um, and I think something that we'll um, think about. And, and I know the, the, um, the conversations about implementation, there's been a lot of sort of proactive discussion about making sure we document that very carefully mm -hmm. so that um, it's something the treasurer's office could share with, with others. So maybe a toolkit that covers both and. Um, we have, let's go one last question here uh, in the front middle. Uh, so wait, 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 wait for the microphone, sorry. <laughs> the online audience, the masses. Thank you. Um, so I'm curious about, you know, in passage, you guys talked about sort of the lack of how difficult it was to build grassroots support. Mm -hmm. You've got two years before this thing goes live, and mm -hmm. unlike the 529 plan, which is entirely voluntary, right, you're going to be taking money out of two and a half million people's, if we're lucky, two and a half million people's paychecks. Like, what's the sort of grassroots work that needs to get done so that gets perceived mm -hmm. as a positive thing mm -hmm. and not a negative thing? Yeah. Yeah, that's a wonderful question, and certainly we're talking a lot with the treasurer about the education component of this. I think that our failure has been to get bogged down in the technicalities of the solution in an environment where there is broad public anxiety about the problem. And I think if we can connect this this action to the very real anxiety about the problem, then we, we have a, uh, a real opportunity to, to you know, be, be viewed as, as helpful as opposed to just kind of confiscatory. Um, that's actually a great transition note. I would like to say thank you to Courtney Eccles uh, and, and Sam Tuttle, uh, who's from the Heartland Alliance. Uh, Courtney's from the Woodstock Institute. Um, would you join me in giving those guys a round of applause? And we're gonna, um, we're gonna transition from our first panel to our second panel. Um, while we do that, um, I, think, I think we actually have the opportunity, Senator Biss, I have a, I have a burning question. Uh, you said, um, uh, or w in the conversation we just learned, you know, the original model here uh, was a traditional IRA. Mm -hmm. And you chose uh, to transition to a Roth IRA. Uh, I, I actually have a, I think this is a, this is a great move. But I, but I think this is a great move for reasons that um, people that I totally respect and, uh, and revere really uh, think it's, it's a bad idea. Uh, and for me, it's really a connection to, to me, the lack of emergency savings that Americans experience, which is really intense uh, and really real, and the lack of retirement savings are really connected. But when I attend a lot of conversations like this one here in Washington, D.C., uh, they tend to be uh, purely retirement focused. Uh, and there, there's little acknowledgement of the lack of emergency savings. And in fact, there's a really negative attitude towards people that go to their retirement account when they're in trouble and, and take money out. You know, it's, that's leakage, that's, um, you know, those unnecessary withdrawals. I think, you know, the data that we have there suggests 
Uh, there's a certain amount of frivolity that occurs there, but, but it's much more likely that these are people who have run into hard times and don't have other uh, good choices uh, that are ahead of them. The Roth is a totally flexible vehicle. People can take their money out of a Roth at any point. Essentially, it's a souped up savings account. Uh, I, I think that's a good thing. Have you thought a lot about how that flexibility is going to play? And does that tie into the question that was just asked about you're taking money out of people's paychecks? Yeah, it's a great question. Let, let me say three things um, quickly about it. Um, first of all, on this direct question of uh, leakage, as people often call it, um, we have to have a great deal of respect for the views of people you, you, you come down on the other side from because the nature of the problem, the whole issue here is that it's really hard for all of us to plan many decades ahead and to kind of appropriately sacrifice now in exchange for having a decent quality of life later. And there's no question that the traditional IRA kind of is a nudge in the, from that point of view, right direction and the Roth isn't. But there, you know, there are emergencies. We're talking about people with um, experiencing significant financial challenge and in many cases uh, real financial hardship. And, um, and I do think particularly if we're going to all of a sudden start taking money out of people's accounts, having that flexibility is, is at the end of the day, I think better than not. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing to say, just obviously, uh, the, from a pure financial point of view, the decision about Roth versus traditional is a bet about future earnings and future tax rates, and it varies from person to person as well as how history develops. But I, I think for the majority of people that we're uh, seeking to help, it, it's likely to be a financially more advantageous move over the course of a lifetime. And the last thing I would say is politics, of course, uh, never failed to play a role in all of this. Um, the fact that a Roth doesn't come with an immediate budget hit is definitely advantageous in seeking to get a bill passed. And um, you know the you think about uh, at the time that we were working on this, we had a 5% income tax rate. 5% of 3% of even a low wage of millions of people is a pretty significant hit to the state budget in an environment where Illinois can't really afford it. And so that was, that was an obstacle that we, we really couldn't get past without changing the structure so as to essentially eliminate it. Yeah, thank you. That, I, I mean, I think we can spend a lot more, a lot more time on that. Uh, but uh, we're joined by three really uh, renowned experts in the field for our second panel. Thank you all for being here. We've just had a, a great discussion about the sort of how and why of secure choice. Uh, I'd like to see if we can pull the lens back a little bit, take a look at what's happening in other states, um, and uh, what secure choice might mean for them. Uh, and I also think we ought to put it in the context of sort of what's happening at the federal level. Um, Mark Ivory is here. Uh, Mark's the senior advisor to the Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, and is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Retirement and Health Policy there. Uh, Mark is behind countless parts of current retirement law, including the Savers Credit and the Simple IRA, and has really been a major force uh, in efforts to expand automated retirement savings uh, in the workplace. Uh, he worked with David John uh, to develop a proposal for the automatic IRA, which I think we've heard confirmed today, but under any circumstances it would be safe to say was a model uh, for secure, secure choice both in California and Illinois. Uh, so Mark, thank you for being here today. Uh, David John is here. David's a strategic, strategic uh, policy advisor for the AARP Public Policy Institute. Uh, he's the co-director of the Retirement Security Project at Brookings uh, and has been working on retirement security issues uh, for a couple of decades here uh, uh, doing incredible work. Uh, Angela Antonelli is here as well. She's the executive director of the Center for Retirement Initiatives at Georgetown University. Uh, she also has a, 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 a distinguished career uh, working in Washington's alphabet soup. Thanks, uh, Justin. Yeah, you're welcome. I, don't I know said if that's deserved. I, I said, it. Yeah, I said distinct. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> it's true. And you're doing really interesting, really incredible work at Georgetown at a new senator that's looking at and trying to support. Uh, some of these state level initiatives. So I'm, I'm really glad to have you all here today. Um, Mark, can you kick us off and, and give us an update? Um, we talked a little bit about my RA earlier, um, but I'd love, I'd love to hear an update on what the administration is doing in this space, um, how the administration views these state level efforts, uh, and, and a word maybe about the, the interplay 
uh, therein. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for putting this together. Uh, it's great to be here with uh, all four of you. Oh, I'm not on here. Thank you. Okay, so again, it's, it's great to be here. It's a pleasure, um, uh, especially with this uh, outstanding group of co-panelists. And um, just to defend myself from your introduction a little bit, uh, I've been involved in uh, or may be responsible for a lot of the things that uh, are in the law today, but only the ones that you like. <laughs> uh, the, the administration has been uh, involved both at the legislative proposal level and at the administrative level. Uh, you spoke uh, about the automatic IRA proposal. Uh, this comes out of something that uh, David uh, and I worked on back in 2005, 2006, that was rolled out uh, at the Heritage Foundation uh, and sponsored by the Retirement Security Project uh, and uh, Heritage and the uh, subsequent organizations that have endorsed and supported it uh, are uh, quite a few, but ARP uh, has been uh, there from, from the beginning. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have bipartisan co-sponsorship in the Senate, in the House, of this automatic IRA concept. And uh, Daniel in Illinois has really been, I think, the first to uh, uh, arrange successfully for legislation to be enacted and signed into law uh, in any jurisdiction that uh, would uh, move this forward. Uh, it is, uh, the Illinois version is uh, very much like the federal version, uh, and you may have mentioned in the earlier panel, one potential difference, and we can discuss this later, which would be of, of interest, is uh, that the federal proposal to automatically enroll those who don't have access to an employer plan, who don't have 401k or, or something similar, a pension at work, to automatically enroll them so they can choose to opt out if they don't want to participate, but will find it easy to participate by just going along with the default, if they do want to participate uh, in IRAs, would involve, uh, for the most part, a very heavily private sector oriented IRA investment approach. In other words, the IRAs that people would be invested in would be provided by the trustees and custodians who provide IRAs today. Uh, those who are willing, interested in providing a, uh, a set of investments that includes a default investment that is low cost and that is uh, uh, something like a uh, target date fund with an alternative that would be principal protected. Uh, and in Illinois, I know last time we spoke, you were still working out the specifics of how your board and your trust would approach the investment issue. The federal version is a very private sector oriented one. The uh, uh, MyRA, which connects up to, to link in this, this administrative initiative, is actually connected to this federal legislative proposal in the, in the following way. The idea would be that employers that don't choose to sponsor a retirement program of any kind uh, that would have more than 10 employees, and in Illinois I think your 25 was your cutoff, uh, would be uh, called upon to automatically enroll their employees in these payroll deduction IRAs. Easy, convenient way to save, same as our 401k saving mechanism, essentially, and the uh, employer would get to choose how to do that. They could tell their employees, it'll all go to IRAs at this financial institution, that's my financial partner. We work with First National Bank of uh, uh, our state, or we work with this mutual fund, brokerage firm, insurance company, credit union, what have you, a sponsor of an IRA. Or they could say, every employee, you just tell me where to send it to your choice of an IRA, and uh, we'll send it there just as we do your paychecks to whatever institution you want your paycheck sent to electronically or by direct deposit. Or, 
And this is all with a view to making life as easy as possible for the employer, uh, an employer that hasn't chosen to adopt a plan. So if they prefer neither of those, but rather just let me have some destination for this that involves no thought on my part and no decision making. You know, I'm like most small business owners and managers, incredibly busy, striving to succeed. I'm not in the business of administering retirement programs. I'm in the business of the business I chose. So they could send it to uh, a U.S. savings bond at the Treasury as a temporary destination to make it easy for the employer. And it would then, in time, roll into the private sector, roll over tax-free into private sector IRAs uh, with the U.S. savings bond as the temporary investment. We then took that element of the legislative proposal and moved forward with it administratively because that doesn't require legislation. The Treasury has issued, of course, U.S. savings bonds for decades and has authority to do that without new acts of Congress. And uh, we announced uh, last year at the uh, uh, Treasury Department that we would put into the market a uh, treasury savings bond that was updated, no fees, easy to use. Uh, we called it the My RA for My Retirement Account. It's a Roth IRA with a U.S. savings bond in it. So the bond is the only investment. The Roth IRA is the tax-favored vehicle in which it's housed. And it's for new savers. The idea is the tens of millions of Americans who are the target of the Illinois program and the various other state programs that uh, both of my colleagues over here have been working on and Reed and uh, New America and, and others, uh, the same target group essentially, those who aren't saving today. And the thought here is not that this will solve the problem by no means, but that at least some of our non-saving fellow citizens might be uh, induced to start saving for the first time to get into a saving habit through a very easy method of saving. Payroll deduction uh, being the first approach, the employer could again send money that the employee chooses to save into this IRA. It would be held at Treasury as an incubator for the very small accounts that are so small that the private sector might not be interested in them or that might be consumed by administrative costs uh, and thereby shrink rather than grow uh, even if they're generating some earnings. So as an incubator, the Treasury would step in. It's a kind of market failure situation here where at some level the trickle of contributions and the balance in the account is so small that it's hard for most of the private sector providers to break even on it. Uh, we would uh, offer a very easy to use, user-friendly uh, new kind of bond. And this is now starting to actually be implemented. You could just add to it. You don't have to buy additional bonds, additional units. Uh, it, it is like an account. You just contribute to it and the bond grows in value. Uh, because it's held in a Roth, it's got the tax tax advantages of a Roth IRA, and it's got the retirement orientation of a Roth IRA, but does have the ability to uh, pay out uh, amounts that are return of your contributions, not the earnings, but the amount you put into it, returns those tax-free without a penalty. The contributions come out tax-free if you meet the requirements of a Roth, which require a holding period and reaching a certain age. But if someone is desperate and needs their money back, they can actually get what they put in back out of it in the short term without a penalty. Not the emphasis, not what we want people to do, but recognizing that if we're going for the lower and moderate income population whom we really most need to encourage to save, uh, this is a kind of safety valve through the Roth design. The thought is when people get $15,000, if they reach $15,000 accumulation over the years, in this they would roll over to the private sector and 
rollover any earlier time they wish. If a private sector IRA wants to take a rollover from one of these my RAs, uh, the, the individual and the IRA trustee go ahead and do that. So that's the, the gist of it. Because it has no fees, no minimum balances, it's very much oriented to the moderate and lower income population. Uh, the employers would choose to participate in this MyRA, this administrative initiative that we are actually already launching. And uh, a bunch of employers have already volunteered and we're working uh, the very initial phase of a kind of careful phased implementation with a limited number of employers in order to make sure that everything works properly, uh, the pipes are all working, uh, that we, if there are any kinks, we get them out of the system before going to a larger scale. And so far, happily, everything looks like it's uh, working well. The individual would, con would decide whether to contribute or not. Uh, and the, as David and I developed when we did the original work on the automatic IRA legislative proposal, which differs from this because it's legislative, it would require employers above a certain size who don't sponsor a plan to serve as a conduit through their payroll system for their employees and to auto-enroll the employees. Uh, the MyRA, the administrative proposal, just asks employers if they wish to participate, they can. And uh, for various reasons, the employee makes an affirmative election to contribute. We don't, we're not ready to start automatic enrollment with that, at least at this uh, stage. The uh, uh, connection here between the MyRA and the state programs has begun to be drawn by some people. Uh, some folks have said to us, would you be willing to make the MyRA available if employers in a given state said, we're interested in using it through the auspices of the state, the, the, whether the state government approached us or the employers approached us as an investment that the state uh, could offer as part of a program secure choice or whatever it, it were uh, called, a program of payroll deduction or other contributions to uh, IRAs. And uh, it would appear that this could work perfectly well if a state wanted to uh, uh, use the existing MyRA as an investment for employees in the state or employers that are doing payroll deduction. But that hasn't been uh, worked by, by us, uh, certainly. We've just been approached by various folks asking, could that be a possible marriage here, a concept? Uh, we uh, uh, very much welcome input on this. And uh, I would note that, when, again, when David and I were working up the, uh, the kind of mother concept here, of automatic enrollment into payroll deduction IRAs, we were thinking not only employers, but self-employed or other folks, right, to have the opportunity to just directly contribute, and the MyRA carries that thought on. Uh, we, in time, uh, as soon as we can reasonably do so, want to add on the ability for anyone, regardless of their workplace or employer connection, to just uh, contribute including, finally, and uh, again, shout out to Reed Kramer and the, the um, New America Foundation, including the tax time mm -hmm. saving. So last thought here to put, put it together as you requested, uh, if people get refunds, as we know, New America's been doing great work and, and others have as well on this, uh, the refund could be at the election of the taxpayer, direct deposited into a saving vehicle like an IRA. You can tell the IRS, I'm getting a $2,500 refund. I've got plans for it, but you know, $500 of it, I could spare that to save. And I'll please just send it to an IRA. Here's my accounting num account number, my routing number, uh, or to buy a U.S. savings bond. Mm -hmm. 
And actually, you can do that with it, again, uh, thanks to the, the good offices and, and work of New America and other, other groups. So the IRS has been very helpful in making those programs possible. Uh, the Treasury folks really um, uh, got this done during uh, the Bush 43 administration, a wonderful bipartisan effort that started in the Clinton years and got, uh, came to fruition um, under uh, the Office of Tax Policy at Treasury and the IRS during uh, the, the latter part of Bush 43 and is being carried on now uh, in the Obama administration. So that's a, a kind of thumbnail of how a lot of these things tie together. Mark, that, that's terrific. Thank you. I, I actually think that, uh, you know, th there's a natural impulse to think about competition here, but I actually think that uh, uh, there's a lot of interesting possibilities in terms of uh, um, having these programs work uh, collaboratively uh, in the future. Angela, we've had a question already about, uh, about things that are happening in other states. Uh, Senator Biss told us, you know, California kind of unlocked the door for Illinois. Uh, is Illinois unlocking the door for other states? What's, what's the state-by-state -state picture look like now? Yeah, if I could get, uh, begin just by saying thank you for allowing us to be here. We're the new kids on the block, the Georgetown Center for Retirement Initiative. So it's something that the folks that are involved in the center are incredibly passionate about, and we hope you know, I'm sitting with folks who've been in this movement for a long time and really pushing the boulder up the hill for some time. And we're just coming into this game, and we hope we can help uh, help with this movement and finally get this boulder up to the top and stabilized and making, uh, uh, hopefully, millions of Americans better off over time. So the objective of the Georgetown Center is really to focus on working in a bipartisan way and continuing what has been a long tradition in this specific area of working in a bipartisan way to develop um, legislative, um, innovative state policies, legislation, and administrative models that are going to expand the availability and the effectiveness of retirement solutions. And as Senator Biss, Justin, and others have already said so well and laid out the issues with retirement insecurity. Again, this is an issue that from, um, and from you know, in terms of economic concerns within this country, Gallup polling 14 years has shown that you know, concerns about retirement security is top of the line and on the mind of most Americans. Um, we want, and, and if this is one of the top concerns, you know, we need to continue to do our best job to, to take the message out there and make the case and convey those concerns to policymakers and have them take action to address it. I mean, 18% of Americans are confident, only 18% are confident they're gonna be able to live comfortably uh, in their retirement years. And more than half of workers plan never to retire and feel like they have to continue to work their entire lives. Uh, and we all know about the lack of confidence that Americans have about their abilities to provide for their basic needs in retirement. And again, as already noted, there are a staggering number of American workers who really, a lot of small businesses, work for small businesses and don't have any access to any kind of retirement plan. I mean, we're talking about more than 70 million Americans. Uh, and even for those who do have access to employer plans, as already noted, the amount of savings that we're talking about that people are able to achieve is relatively small. Somewhere in the $14,000 range and, and with IRAs, I think even with uh, 401ks, it's a relatively modest amount, somewhere in the $18,000 range. These are numbers that are not acceptable as we've shifted over the past 30 years from defined benefit towards more defined contributions. And we've, in fact, shifted all the responsibilities to individuals to take that responsibility and assume the risks and saving for their retirement. And with the average Social Security benefits around $1,300 a month, and if, in fact, you look at overall the, the overall asset picture for most families, whether it's their home equity, their ability to save, they actually have very little. And so what are we looking at in the future with, re with regards to a demographic silver tsunami of, of families and individuals who really won't have much more other than Social Security to retire on? Um, and what are the implications for the states in the future with this tsunami? What does it mean in terms of housing, food, transportation, and other social service needs? And, and what are the implications both at the federal level from a budget perspective and at the state level as we move forward? So do we take action now and try to help people save more? Or do we just simply continue to stick our heads in the sand, hope the problem is not really as bad as what we have been hearing, and that everything's going to just turn out fine? Or 
we may have um, some really severe budget issues that we'll have to continue to deal with. So the Center for Retirement Initiatives is really focused on working collaboratively in a bipartisan way and being a resource to the states, a clearinghouse for the states, helping to bring states together. We have so many states, and I'll get to that in a second, who have been developing and designing models. Auto IRA is the most predominant at this point. And we want to help them not every state reinvent the wheel, bring them together, will be a source for dealing with a lot of the issues uh, key issues that they're dealing with in terms of legal and regulatory issues, whether they're at the federal level or state or otherwise, um, cost issues, budgetary issues, uh, but again, to be a resource for the states, to track what's happening in the states, and to work with the states ultimately to develop models. Every state's different. We take the position, um, you know, let the states lead. States are, have been innovative in a number of different <coughs> areas. They are continuing to be, as we see with Illinois and the leadership there innovative and in moving the ball forward. So, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. We want to be a resource to help those flowers bloom uh, and provide, um, provide resources, research, and assistance to help states develop the models that work best for them. So what's happening in the states today? Um, there's at least 24 states in recent years that have considered plans or studies to examine the ways to address the issues of private sector savings. Um, and amazingly, in 2015, again, I think we're reaching a point where, again, a lot of the work done by, by folks that I have the pleasure to be sitting with here and many others uh, for some years, the folks at the Woodstock Institute and the Heartland Alliance, the state-based organizations that have year after year keep coming back on this issue. Um, we now have in 2015, we're three months into the year, and we have 16 bills that have been introduced around the country, ranging from the secure choice models to study bills. And three have been enacted. I count Illinois because it was, in fact, signed, if I'm not mistaken, in January, even though action was taken in 2014 to move it along. And then most recently in March, we had Utah and Virginia pass study bills. So we have 16 states have taken action, three enactments so far. I think it's possible that we may see one or two other states cross the finish line, and I'll get that get to that in a second. So in terms of plans that have been enacted, we, we've already talked about California and Illinois. They're the big guys states that have been out there and bravely taken it on California in 2012 and Illinois this year, uh, starting to move the ball forward. And then we have a number of states that have enacted studies to look at the issues. I think that's also a great strategy. I mean, if you have to do it incrementally, start with the study, start to make the case, start to look at the issues, start to see how it's going to work in your state. Every state's different demographically with respect to its economies, its small business, its workforce. So look at what your state is dealing with and what's going to make most sense there. Connecticut and Minnesota have been studying the issue since 2014, and they will continue to do so through the balance of this year. And we'll see at the end of this year and beyond, they will be issuing reports, um, typically with principles and other um, basic design characteristics that seem to be most suitable for their states. And then again, as I mentioned, Utah and Virginia have studies that they've enacted um, and we'll move forward this year with those. And, the, and Vermont in 2014 also had a study. So you had Connecticut, Minnesota, and Vermont. Vermont had some issues with respect to tight timing and funding um, and ha has asked for an extension to be able to study the issues in Vermont beyond 2016. So overall, five states um, have been actively and will begin to actively study the issues. And then we have the Secure Choice Model Bills. We had three that were introduced very recently, Massachusetts, Maryland, and New Jersey. Uh, and then we have other states that have done so in the past but have not yet picked it up again. Um, let me just say for all of this information that I'm providing to you, you can go to our website, cri.georgetown.edu. We have an interactive map on the front page. We try very hard with the huge number of resources that exist at the moment at the center <laughs> and some great <laughs> students. Um, to keep up to date, and folks are really good about giving us updates about what's happening in their states, but you can go on there and click on any states um, that, are, that are taking action. And certainly to the extent that you see things happening, you know, please feel free. Um, and my contact information is on the website um, to reach out, and I welcome updates that are provided. So you have a number of states with the secure choice model, and then quite honestly, the other models are very similar. They might not be called secure choice, and largely the major difference is the mandatory voluntary issue. Um, so we have six others that were introduced in 2015 in Indiana, Kentucky, Massachusetts, North Dakota, Oregon, and Washington State. Massachusetts is interesting because it's kind of this hybrid model. Mass is actually taking an interesting strategy. They've in, as far as I can tell, they've introduced a couple of bills. One is the traditional secure choice, but then they're also saying, okay, 
let's let's put another another model in there and see which ones we're going to move. Now, Mass already has a 401k nonprofit um, plan that they've had implemented now for two or three years. Um, but the, so they have the secure choice, but they also have now a sort of IRA, 401k, you know, both tracks. Um, also, it wrapped up in, in, in a legislative proposal. So they're looking at both. Mass is, is one of the states, then we can get to the ERISA issues, but is one of the states that has not necessarily been concerned uh, about making sure that things are, are not covered by ERISA. So they're willing to sort of look and fit within the, the legal uh, and regulatory requirements of, of ERISA. Uh, Oregon, again, is moving forward. Um, they have to take um, their proposal, again, again, all of these auto-enroll, payroll deduction, issue of mandatory and voluntary on the employers. Um, Oregon it has, to, has some provisions in there that require them to look at various issues um, and, and assess feasibility, market analysis, things like that. And then the thing, the other, I think, which is the uh, model that's probably the most um, different and kind of standing out at this point and has moved quite far uh, in the in the legislature is in Washington State. Washington State has a marketplace model. So if you think ACA and healthcare, and what we see, I think that's probably a, a similar analogy, where Washington State is basically saying, look, we're going to set up an internet-based website. It's a marketplace. You have to have these different types of IRA models, and then one of the other models you have to. Uh, include is my RA. So this is a perfect example of where you're taking what the federal government is doing in their proposals and integrating it with what the states are doing. So again, Washington State, marketplace model, multiple options, multiple types of products. Not surprisingly, it's the uh, opposition from the financial services industry uh, that's been longstanding. Um, is, has dissipated um, with respect to this particular model. So they're supportive uh, of this effort. And therefore, it's been able to move relatively quickly through House and Senate. And there's the only differences, as far as I can tell at this point, in terms of reconciliation, is just how it's going to be funded. The dollars and the provision of funding, there's some debate where we've seen in some cases, again, tight fiscal situations. Can you appropriate dollars to support implementation? In other states like California, they've had to reach out to private sources to help them do some of the studies and be able to move forward. So hopefully that will get reconciled, and hopefully the state will actually appropriate dollars to be able to move the Washington state model forward. Uh, and then again, Colorado, New Hampshire, West Virginia, Wisconsin are other states that have introduced study bills that haven't, haven't progressed. So that's what's happening in the states. It's exciting. But why is it important, and why is Illinois important? You want to do that? Yeah. Okay. David, actually, okay. that, that is actually a great transition point yeah. to, uh, to you, David. Right. AARP has been involved at the state level very as well, so. very yes. much so. And you have, you have hit some history here as well. Can you, um, can you tell us a little bit about sort of AARP's work? And really, I'd love to hear sort of about your perspective on, on the policy question here. Sure. <clears throat> well, first, this is actually an important day for me for AARP because it was exactly two years ago today that I joined. And I will say that it was with a certain amount of trepidation that a guy from the Heritage Foundation showed up at AARP to start a job <laughs> on April Fool's Day. <laughs> and I was grateful that there really was a job there. That explains all your tweets about April Fool's Day. Now. There all we are. Jokes. Yes. I got it. But it, one of the things that I managed to do by joining AARP was to join a really good team of people who are working on this issue. We work very closely with Senator Biss. Uh, we work very closely with uh, a variety of people, probably in about 30 states at this point. Uh, there is actually a member who does the real work in the back of the room there, Jerry Madrid Davis, who is in the far left and uh, goes out from state to state. and. Jerry is a, uh, an excellent manager who, among other things, hires really good people. So if you come across Sarah Mishavitz Gill, who's from Illinois, et cetera, uh, she works for Jerry. Now, we are active in several different ways in uh, the state issues. Uh, one is that we do have 50 state offices that uh, what we would call work and save is a, a priority of AARP and is actually uh, being pushed in many of those state offices. We also work on the policy area. I'm in what's called the Public Policy Institute at AARP. It's sort of our internal think tank. And among other things, we have a website, uh, the State Retirement Resources 
or Retirement Savings Resource Center, uh, which uh, look, has a variety of policy papers, including some of Angela's and uh, various others, uh, to try to help people shape the policy and put it together. Uh, and that's a rather crucial issue. I mean, one of the things that we're looking at that Angela referred to is the whole question of how does this fit with an ERISA policy? And we've got a paper up there, Angela's got a paper, and there are other papers that we will put in there. And let me just make something very clear. ERISA is a good law. ERISA provides protections for workers who have retirement savings plans. And those protections need to be honored and actually strengthened. ERISA is not intended to protect industries from having competition in markets that they don't do a very good job in. <laughs> ERISA is not intended to protect employers from the slight inconvenience of putting together a payroll deduction retirement savings plan set up by the state. ERISA is intended to allow people to save, and it should not be used to prevent people from building the kind of retirement security that they need to have. And that's one of the things that we need to focus on, both at the federal level and at the state level. We talked a little bit about, and Daniel mentioned, uh, automatic enrollment. And automatic enrollment is crucial, because if we look at the research, for instance, that uh, has been done by a variety of people, at the excellent paper in Illinois, and we are actually about to put up a paper on implementation costs that was uh, produced by uh, your organization there. Uh, we look and we see that of the five groups who are most likely to undersave, and this is true nationally and this isn't true in every single state, women, minority groups, younger workers, lower income workers, and employees of small businesses. And that automatic enrollment works in every single one of those areas to bring the participation rate from somewhere in the 15, 20, 25 percent range up to the national average. So automatic enrollment is crucial, but automatic enrollment is also incredibly popular among the workers. We participate both as AARP and my Brookings project with FINRA in a group called Retirement Made Simpler with an R at the end because somebody else got the other website first. And uh, we did some polling of people who had been auto-enrolled. And among the workers who were auto-enrolled <coughs> and stayed in the program, it was like a North Korean election. 95, 96, 98 <laughs> percent like it. They knew they started saving earlier. They knew they needed to save earlier, et cetera, et cetera. Amongst the roughly 15 percent, 20 percent in some cases, who were auto-enrolled and opted out, we had support ranges in the 80, 85 percent range. So in other words, when an employer looks at this and says, well, gosh, I don't want to make my employees angry or things like that. We have information showing that this is something your employers, employees want. And last but not least, when Mark and I were working on the Auto IRA, we had uh, a very good company that did some uh, research with us. And they studied the employers. And when we were talking to the person who did the research, he said, you know, this is an unusual thing. Because when I talked to the employers, the more they learned about the proposal, the stronger they supported it, and the more their opposition declined. So this is a national issue. It's a national question. We are working in the individual states. And I must give credit here. About 2008 or so, I was sitting talking to Mark. And he said, well, you know, I'm doing some work in California. And I'm doing and Washington State and various others. And I say, well, what the hell are you doing that for? We're working on the federal level. <laughs> and and we're, we're bound to win on the federal level. Why the states? So when you really look at the father of the state plans, he's sitting right here wearing a green tie. Uh, <laughs> we must continue the work. And let me make one final point, because I'm sure we want to get on and either discuss and or bring in the audience here. 
Justin has mentioned the whole question of asset building and retirement savings. And this is not two issues. This is the same thing. At AARP, we have this wonderful uh, term we call economic resilience. And economic resilience means that we know that people must save for the future. And there's always something that's more important or more immediate. But if you don't have the opportunity to save for the future, whether it's through a state plan or through a national plan, should there ever be one, uh, or when there is one, excuse me, uh, this is a crucial element. But we also know that there are going to be the inevitable bumps along the way. And the bumps are going to be things like losing a job, getting in an accident, the roof leaking, something along that line. We need to have things structured in a way so that individuals can meet those needs. And if we worry about leakage from retirement accounts, which frankly I do, uh, one of the things we can do is to arrange it so that people can save perhaps both in a retirement plan and in a non-retirement plan so they can use that non-retirement plan first. Thank you, David. I, I don't want to belabor that point, but I, I, uh, I have a jaw dropper for me after all these years in this. It's, the jaw dropper for me is, uh, connecting those issues is that we, we talk about a lack of access in, on the retirement savings side, but 30% of Americans don't have a savings account. And so, you know, I've known that stat for years and I still have a hard time wrapping my head around it. And it's, uh, I think, a critical point uh, uh, to recognize that we have one issue here that runs through. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Uh, Senator Biss, I, there's a lot to chew on here. I, I want to dig in really quickly to this, to this ERISA question. This is something that you guys uh, wrestled really clearly and strongly with in the law. Can you tell us sort of how you handled uh, uh, the question of whether uh, this, there would be ERISA liability uh, in, in the Secure Choice Plan and, and how you see that sort of looking forward? I can, but I'd rather tell you how I should have addressed it, which is to give that speech that David gave about ERISA. <laughs> um, I, you know, you're, you know that you're, I think this actually speaks, you know, to the point of the previous panel about how to build grassroots support around this issue. I, you worry that you're in the bubble when someone gives a passionate series of comments about ERISA and you want to get up and start cheering and take your tie off and wave it around in the universal sign of those were good comments about ERISA. Um, but anyhow, we didn't have the benefit of that, um, those prepared comments back when we were trying to pass the bill. Um, I think there is a genuine question about how to, where in the, where if anywhere in the ERISA framework, uh, uh, law as the Illinois law is structured might fit. Um, and in addition to that being a genuine question, it became a very significant political question um, as the opponents would claim that this was triggering all kinds of uh, legal and potentially financial liability for employers and for the state, and it, it, it became a political argument. So the way that we wound up structuring the or addressing the question in the, in the law was to simply uh, direct the board, once it's created, to send a letter of inquiry to the federal government. And should the response come back that there is an ERISA preemption that exposes the state or employers to liability, that the program will, uh, will, the implementation will halt until that matter is resolved. Um, and it, this is, you know, there, there's a very, I think I think it's really important to separate the technical questions from the policy questions because they're both real and they sort of sound similar. One is kind of technically under the current letter of the law as interpreted by the Department of Labor, where does this sit? And the other question is what is the appropriate mechanism in this new world of a state-created uh, retirement scheme to provide the appropriate protections for workers. And I, I think it's important that wherever we sit on the, regarding ERISA, that we uh, find a mechanism to have uh, appropriate protections, because otherwise you could be walking into a pretty, pretty perilous world. Mark, the administration takes this 
seriously, it seems to me, because there's language in the budget proposal this year uh, that tries to address this question, uh, or at least at least starts to say, hey, we think these state plans uh, have merit and should be investigated, uh, and, and we ought to make it okay for, for some experimentation to happen here. Uh, Justin, yes, uh, <coughs> it's not, um, I wouldn't use the term investigated, but uh, we do think they have merit, yes, and you're right. Uh, the Labor Department has a proposal in the uh, budget portion of the administration's budget that relates to that department that uh, proposes that Congress authorize six and a half million dollars for uh, distribution to several states to be selected as uh, sites for pilot projects uh, of the sort that Illinois and the various other states are uh, about to do or are considering. The thought is that with that legislation would come uh, an express grant of authority to uh, depart from whatever the uh, otherwise applicable scope of ERISA might be uh, and to make clear that ERISA might not apply uh, at least fully or partially or in certain conditions to employer-sponsored uh, arrangements such as payroll deduction IRAs or uh, others. Uh, potentially this could include the sort of Illinois model uh, or the other alternative models where the application of ERISA might arise as a possible issue. Now the proposal does not uh, say, uh, is not intended to uh, uh, take a position on whether ERISA does or does not apply to existing models. Uh, so uh, one could uh, view this proposal, and I think should view this proposal, as independent of the question, would ERISA apply to uh, a uh, payroll deduction automatic IRA arrangement that involves automatic enrollment in IRAs, that involves a requirement that employers that don't sponsor plans uh, make their payroll systems available to their employees as a conduit for the employee to have an easier way to save his or her own wages in his or her own mm -hmm. tax-favored uh, account. Uh, so without prejudice to the legal issue that you and Daniel have adverted to, uh, there's a proposal to provide funding and to provide explicit uh, authority to depart from ERISA for the purposes of, of experimenting, if you will, mm -hmm. see whether to see whether uh, it, it might be uh, worth doing more legislatively regarding these plans. Now, this is not to say that other uh, legislative initiatives at the federal level might not be desirable or uh, forthcoming, mm -hmm. uh, but this is one step that uh, uh, the administration and the Labor Department, which has, as you know, has the jurisdiction over whether ERISA applies to particular arrangements, uh, have taken so far. Mm. So maybe if there are members of the Illinois congressional delegation listening to this conversation, they, they might be interested in introducing further legislation. David, how do we, how do we start to, uh, the question of sort of state by state uh, versus sort of a national plan uh, and whether we reach a point where there is um, th there is sort of conflict there I mean you talked you touched on this a little bit already but but uh, you know are we designing plans at the state level now that um, uh, can be part of a na a truly national framework oh, absolutely. yes how does I mean, that work well, one of the beauties of what's going on in the state level is, as Angela pointed out, that the plans are being designed to meet specific needs of individual states and individual uh, jurisdictions and the like. One of the things that we are seeing here, I mean, the states are, are, in a sense, the laboratories of democracy. So we are seeing the, the development of different types of models, and we're going to actually get to see how they work as we go along. 
And as we get to the point that it's time for a federal solution on this, it is not necessarily a federal solution that, says, that sweeps all of this away. It's a federal solution that builds this. And it may well be that what we find is that a particular model that some of us uh, were kind of uh, skeptical about really does work very well. So that when we structure this, the final national solution to this, the national plan, that in addition to the state's we can actually expand out some of the features that we're finding in the, uh, the current process. Senator Biss, what, what, as, you, as you envision it, or what happens now if uh, the plan comes online in 2017, mm -hmm. I'm a worker uh, in Chicago, and I uh, work and live in Chicago, and I have an employer that participates in the plan, and then in 2019, I move to Indiana. Uh, does, what happens to me and, and my plan? Do we, do we know? Uh, yes, we know. Um, sort of. Mm. Um, <laughs> so first of all, there you are. You still exist. Your plan still exists. It certainly is, from a legal standpoint, a Roth IRA like any other can be rolled over into a, a vehicle that you plan to use at your new employer. The one thing that I would say is not crystal clear in the law, but I think is by omission becomes reasonably clear is, do you, should you now move to Indiana um, and find yourself uh, lacking at your new employer uh, a retirement vehicle that you care to use, may you continue on a non-automatic enrollment, but sort of purely kind of voluntary active writing checks yourself periodically basis to contribute uh, into the Illinois Secure Choice account that, that has already been uh, established in your name and already has assets in it. The, the law is silent on that, but I think by its silence, it, it essentially authorizes the board to allow such, a, mm -hmm. such an arrangement to, to move on, and I would envision some people would conceivably do so. Mm -hmm. Mark? Uh, one thing to add as a technical matter, uh, a Roth IRA, uh, is not something that can actually roll over to an employer plan under the current state of the law, as, as Daniel and David and I have discussed in the past. We are uh, uh, considering uh, proposing legislation. We haven't worked this yet, but we're thinking about uh, whether legislation could be crafted to allow Roth IRAs to roll over tax-free into employer-sponsored plans. They can roll over to other uh, IRAs, but not employer plans at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, the reasons are ones I won't go into here, but uh, it is quite possible to conceive of a, an appropriately framed piece of legislation that would uh, allow that. That's really interesting. Thank you. And, and if we look at the existing 529 plans, which are offered by the states, there is the ability to contribute to a different state's 529. You don't necessarily get the tax benefits from your home state if you do so, but it still allows you to contribute into state. So and, and David, I'm glad you mentioned the 529 model, because that's really one of the things that we started with back in the mid-2000s in talking to California, talking to uh, Washington, uh, Illinois, Maryland, other states, Connecticut that were starting to get interested at that stage, they have 529s. Right, right. Those are private sector run investment programs. Uh, in those cases, the state typically contracts with one uh, investment firm. Mm -hmm. But in the models that uh, we've discussed with the states and that the states have gotten interested in, uh, there's the possibility of following the federal automatic IRA approach and having uh, many private sector players provide the investments, provide the IRAs. Uh, so uh, that is, but, but the 529 model continues to be something that I know many of the states look to as a kind of analogy mm -hmm. to what might be done here, even if the investment arrangements might be more pluralistic with respect to uh, private sector investments or might be different in some other way. 
And, and if you look at the debate on 529s way back when, a lot of the arguments that are being made about today, you could verbatim take them from the debate on 529s. The concerns about the competition, what would happen in the marketplace, uh, taking business away from from other from financial firms and, and savings plans. Um, and we see where we are now with 529s. I mean, they're thriving. You look at the billions of assets that are now saved in these plans around the country. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, I think, generally most people would think we're better off because of it. Mm -hmm. And in its development, quite frankly, again, sort of federal and state, as the momentum was building with the states and the experimentation, there were tax issues that needed to be resolved. As the momentum built, the federal government addressed those tax issues. and the floodgates opened and 529s were able to spread throughout the country. So uh, historically, 529s are a great model to look at in how they developed and, and of course where we are today and how they're managed. We are really close to our witching hour, but I don't want to leave the audience uh, out of this. Uh, we have a microphone again. If uh, folks have questions for our panel, we would, uh, we would, we would welcome them. Hi, um, I'm Kristen Johnson from the Oregon State Treasurer's Office. Um, hello, and I just wanted to, I should start off by saying thank you to everybody on the panel. Um, without all of you, as particularly Angela, we would not be as far in our process as we are. Um, my question is actually for Mark. Um, the irony that we're facing right now is that some of our opponents are saying, we don't need to support a plan because the MIRA exists. Um, is, can you speak a little bit to the $15,000 cap and whether you think that will ever um, you know, be raised at all? Well, the MIRA is not intended to compete with anything. The MIRA is intended, as these other efforts are, to uh, make it easier for working people in this country to save. And uh, in particular, it's sensitive to not competing with existing arrangements such as private sector offerings, be they 401ks or IRAs, uh, nor is it intended to supplant uh, state uh, initiatives, uh, much less the, the federal automatic IRA uh, proposal. So it is intended to do what it can in the here and now in uh, a context that's administrative doesn't require any legislation, uh, to encourage people to save with a very uh, safe, principle protected, no downside investment. Uh, not the only way to invest, not the only way to save. And certainly even that investment is only provided here, as you say, for people up to a $15,000 level, because the thought is that that's a, an incubator, again, a way to get people comfortable who haven't saved before and who might be concerned about market risk. Well, David. I, another thing to think about in describing this is that my IRA is very important, but my IRA is a tool. It's not a solution. What you're talking about in Oregon, what the states are talking about, what Illinois is doing, that's a solution. And that's really what's going to be in the long term needed. Yeah. We don't have any current plans to change the $15,000 uh, limit. It's really, it was set at that level in large part because we wanted this to be a transitional arrangement, something that would just incubate the very small accounts and then have them turn over into the, the regular market that most of us are uh, saving. Well, if there aren't other, I have sort of a longish comment. Go ahead. I'm gonna, sorry. Hi, um, I want to maybe combine two questions into one, but I think they're related. Um, two issues that I think um, are important are cost and consolidation, and you've all sort of addressed both of them a little bit. And I'm just wondering if any of you could talk about thoughts um, going forward into better ways to address costs, especially for what are likely to be small balance accounts, um, and then also the issue of consolidation which affects cost and, again, important for accounts with smaller balances and people who may move around the workplace um, that, more often. That's a, those are great questions, and I, I think they are closely related. Um, uh, Senator Biss, let's, if you would, would you respond to that and, and also maybe transition into sort of 
closing thoughts and comments from you. For sure. Thank for you. Sure. Um, so I think, first of all, as a matter of legislative design, that, that's why, and I'll, I'll actually frame all this, both, both the answer and my closing thoughts, under the same umbrella, which I think has sort of been hanging over us through both panels and almost never been explicitly mentioned, which is the extraordinary value in thinking through this set of policy questions and even more importantly, the set of tactical and political questions of the healthcare analogy, mm. uh, which is, I think, it's just very present in this room. Um, so you can view what, the, what we've done in Illinois as a kind of, a, a kind of a individual mandate with a public option, essentially. And I think the, the challenge associated with cost and the need for scale as one of the key tools to drive down cost is uh, a reason why it's important not to give up that public option. And that, that is the tool that we've utilized in Illinois to bring down cost. Um, it also becomes a tool to address consolidation, as you, to use the word differently, consolidate more people into a single program. The risk of fragmentation as people move from employer to employer decreases significantly. But beyond that, I think the only tool we have at our disposal in Illinois on the consolidation question is one of education and really kind of aggressive communication. It's, it's a tricky problem without any obvious solution in the current fragmented market. I, I want to close by saying a little bit more about the healthcare analogy because I, I think we find ourselves in kind of a pre-Harris Wofford moment, if you will. If you think back to the moment in 1991 when uh, Senator Hines of Pennsylvania died suddenly and was replaced by Harris Wofford who then shortly after had to stand for a special election and was expected by most to lose, was way behind, and hit upon with a team of political consultants you may have heard of, people like Paul Begala, um, hit upon in their polling the realization that if they talked about the creation of a health insurance option for all Pennsylvania workers, that totally transformed the nature of the campaign, used that message to win that election, and then, of course, the people who worked for him, wound up having a significant role in the 1992 presidential election, which put this issue on the national uh, agenda. Um, though, of course, it then took another 20 years to achieve a national law, which is maybe a dangerous data point as well. I think we're sitting in that moment before 1991 where the issue is real, the problem is deep, the public anxiety is there, and the political spark that creates a flame hasn't somehow quite been lit. And we're, you know, as we enter, frankly, a presidential election year, I hope that somebody running for, uh, for president is able to, to tap into that public anxiety and elevate this issue to the kind of top, top, top of the national agenda that I think will eventually be necessary in order for us to eventually pass national legislation. In the meantime, as we wait, uh, hopefully, for that to happen before long, the action taken by the states is enormously positive. First of all, because we can help literally millions of people who live in the states that we work in, but also because it, it moves that agenda forward. And then if you, if you think about how the type of shape that a national solution may eventually take, particularly if you take this analogy seriously and imagine the creation of some kind of national mandate with partnerships with states to, um, to execute it, any work that states will have done in advance of that will not be in competition with national legislation, but will actually be literally a part of the implementation eventually of national legislation. And so I think that as we, just in closing, it's, it's really exciting for me to have a chance to come out of Illinois and talk with uh, people working in Washington, D.C., and elsewhere in the country on this issue because I, I think if we handle ourselves properly, there's an opportunity that before too long, the efforts that are taking place in a few different states can spread to become a part of a national effort that eventually could be, I would hope, a true national solution for what is a very, very deep problem. So thank you again for including me. Thank you so much. Let me say thanks to our audience, uh, both in the room and online. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, we have a, a paper we've published today with our analysis of the law in Illinois and some of the 
um, some of the issues of implementation and design that, that remain to be addressed, um, uh, that's available on our website, assets.newamerica.org. Um, would you please join me in thanking both of our incredible panels here today?